Welcome to the newsmaker. Banks around the world and in Switzerland are cashing into the digital transformation and spending big bucks. Joining me now to talk about this is David Arnott. He's the CEO of Temenos. Great to have you here, David. Thank you, Martina. So first of all, are the big banks spending enough on the digital transformation? Certainly, they're spending a lot of money on IT in general. On average, banks spend 16, 17 percent on, on, on their IT systems compared to three or four percent for any other any other industry. Um, the challenge is that most of that spend today is still going on maintaining what we call the internal legacy spaghetti systems that were built 30 or 40 years ago, and that 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 cost to maintain these old systems tends to be quite all-consuming. So around 80 percent of most banks in the world spend today is just just surviving, just just um, maintaining the existing systems. How then, much uh, spaghetti? Is there still lot, in the a system? Lot, a lot. Still a lot of spaghetti about there. About eighty percent of banks today maintain internal spaghetti systems, and they're starting to answer your question. They're starting to understand the need to, to to spend more money wisely, to become more digital, digital to the core, to go out and compete against the new type of players we're seeing in the industry. So definitely, the trend is emerging very quickly, and Swiss banks are starting to spend more and more on the customer digital experience. So Temenos uh, is uh, developing software for the banking giants, right, in this world, That's and right. you've been doing so for the past 25 years right. already, so mm -hmm. business must be as good as never before. It certainly is. We have to say, we, the founder of Temenos um, back 25 years ago had a very clear view that at some point, banks, would, banks who today are the only industry in the world to try and write their own software, a manufacturer would never go and buy we can never go and get developers to build a manufacturing system. They buy a package, right? And banks are the only people in the world to write their own software because they've been protected. Margins in banking have been very, very high for the last 30 or 40 years. There wasn't really much new competition in banking. So if you could be profitable and be inefficient on IT and get away with it, why would you not? So where so, do you see the biggest opportunities at this point in time, David? Uh, I would say around the world. So the big trend we're seeing at the moment is in the last few years, we've seen three or four converging trends happening at the same time. First of all, open banking initiatives like PSD2 allow new, banking, new banks to come in. People like Amazon, Apple, Google, people you would never have thought of as a competitor are starting to eat your lunch. Exactly, the fangs of the world, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. So how is Google and Amazon competing with you? You must be feeling the heat as well in they're this so uh, much, game. It's not so much that they're competing with us. Listen, what we do is we drive inefficiency out of banks. Banks who have been very, very caught asleep at the wheel, if you like, spending money, not really differentiating themselves. The banking experience for most customers hasn't changed much in the first, last 40 years. But you must be years. scared, David, that they are going to eat into your piece of cake, no? Not so much us. It's what they're starting to do is to take wallet share from the banks. In the past, you went to your bank and you had a, a bank would typically have a loss leading current account and they would make profit from their customer by offering them foreign exchange when they went on holiday, mortgages, loans, deposits. They were the profitable parts of the ecosystem. What's interesting in the world of open banking is new players like Amazon, Apple, Google are coming into the industry and they're taking off, they're cherry picking the profitable parts and they're doing it very, very well. So you might make your payments through Apple. You might go to a robo advisory platform for some deposits. You might go to an online deposit taker like an ING Direct to get a slightly better rate. And the challenge is with banks, they're spending so much money just staying alive that they can't compete with these very, very very, very nimble new players in the market. So it's, it's more that they threaten the franchise of banks themselves rather than compete against us. It's not just uh, the tech giants, uh, but also smaller fintech players are entering the mm. market. Do you see any consolidation there? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, Industries tend to consolidate for one of two reasons. Either a market matures and there's no more growth, and the players in that market have to consolidate and get together to extract remaining savings to drive profit margins. The other reason you can see consolidation in any industry is because a market is hotting up. And you can clearly see now the last industry in the world that's been, that's been writing its own software is being threatened by new competitors, millennial behaviour, happy to have multiple banking relationships, a regulator who is actively encouraging other banking participants to come into the banking ecosystem. It's like a hundred year storm. Everything is happening to banks at once. The smart ones are figuring out what they need to do and they're taking the best assets of being a bank, the customer understanding, the fact that they have a balance sheet and they're regulated so they can offer mortgages and loans and deposits, but they're mashing that up with the best of being a fintech provider. And that's what Temenos does today. We give them the skills to make them more nimble and app nimble like an Amazon or an Apple, and they take their banking core competence so that there's almost going to be a divide in banking. Those that get it and play to their strengths and power themselves with good technology, and those that become, in our opinion, more utility-like. And this means that a lot of the traditional banks that don't adapt uh, and don't change and don't jump on this uh, shape of... Uh, 
blockchain and uh, fintech, etc., they will lose and they might collapse as well. What do you think? Possibly. It's very difficult to say today what the bank of the future is. The one thing we all know for sure is it's very different to the bank of today. You go back 20 years, a bank had to manufacture and produce its own product, right? Loans, mortgages, deposits. So, And they distributed those through branches. So the cost of maintaining a full banking offering and physically opening branches, so real estate in all the major centres where you needed to be, was very, very expensive. And therefore, there were very few new banks. We've had no real new banks in Europe in the last 100 years until about 10 years ago. How concerned are you about the Swiss banks here? Do you think that they are ahead of the pack, uh, leading the game, or are they falling behind? I think from a, from a Swiss banking context, the Swiss, the Swiss banks, like any other world, any other banks in the world, have had the same challenges, millennials, regulator opening up competition, the competition's coming into a white space to offer banking products. They've got all of that, plus they've had the end of banking secrecy. But in fact, the end of banking secrecy has not had the impact you would have expected. It's actually, been, it's actually been quite positive in many ways. But we're starting to see a bifurcation in Switzerland of the, the small cantonal banks, if you like, which have got a very loyal retail customer base, are, are very well protected. The large brands, the, the tier one brands with the, off, with the franchise that they've got and the depth of experience and the, globally, the, the global presence they have are able to, able to survive. The ones in the middle are the ones that are being squeezed. And that's where we're seeing most activity and, uh, in terms of reinventing themselves as new digital disruptors. So Switzerland's very well positioned, Talking for sure. Talking about your technology as well in the banking software that you're developing, to which extent do you use a blockchain already? We do support blockchain, obviously. That's not really, it doesn't impact directly so much. What we basically sell is a bank in a box to remove from the back office of a bank spaghetti that shouldn't be being built by a bank. That's what we do. We go in and put in something that's exactly the same in any bank. However that banking technology is used, it doesn't really impact us so much. So we're very aware, in fact, we're just launching, and you'll see an announcement in the next couple of days over about some initiatives in this, in this space. We're able to support uh, cryptocurrencies. There's a lot of activity here in my hometown of Zug, actually, in terms of supporting alternative technology uses. We support distributed ledger technologies as Was well. Was that one of the reasons why you moved from Geneva to Zug uh, to tap into the cryptocurrencies <laughs> as well? Very interesting. Actually not, no. I was just fed up of missing the connection between G Geneva and Zurich Airport. So when I became CEO, given we're a global company, with 75 offices and customers all around the world, most of my time, as you'd expect, for a fast-growing software company, the number one banking software company in the world, is spent with clients. We're a very client-centric company, so Zurich is a far, far better hub to, to access our global client base. So tell me how exactly you're planning to use cryptocurrencies and which ones? Is it Bitcoin, Ethereum or any other It's form? more for banks themselves to disturb. We do believe there's a role for banks in, in the cryptocurrency market for tokenization overall. We do believe that banks can be a very good custodian. We're slightly on the fringes because at the moment we're waiting for the regulatory environment to be sorted out. Um, and until there's certain questions answered, things like automated KYC checks and certain questions around the overall market, Temenos stands ready to support our, our, our end market. So our end market ultimately is banks. If they can find a role supporting, supporting cryptocurrencies as a custodian or a value transfer agent, whatever that role would be, clearly is with the level of R&D spend that we have, we spend more money on research and development than any other banking software company in the world, we will, we will be there first. And, and you'll see some announcements in the next few days of some investments in this area. Can you give me some numbers already in terms of uh, investments? Overall, for Kind Temenos? of uh, the scope uh, that you're mentioning yeah. OK, here. so we have about 5,000 employees in Temenos today, about half of whom, just under half, are involved in developing software. So we design our software close to our customers, so private banking in Switzerland, retail banking in the various centres, and we build that in in very, very industrialised, very, very powerful factories. So, so how so much uh, do you around spend Around $200 on million dollars this year will be spent on research, million which, US is, which is close year. already to the spend of the world's biggest banks. The, the, the interesting thing about software is it tends to be a winner-takes-all game. If you look at industries like the desktop, nobody would compete with Microsoft today. Nobody would compete with SAP and Oracle. Software always is a winner-takes-all game with very little space for a second or third player because the biggest player dominates the market, they sell more software, they recycle that revenue back into strong R&D, to your point. And once you've emerged in that leadership position, it's very difficult to catch. So the fact that in the last few years we've been winning all the big deals, Santander, Bank of Ireland, Commerce Bank in the US, and recycling that back into such a big R&D roadmap, when you can go to a bank and say, I'm a software company, and I spend as much on research and development as you do to a tier one bank, and I'm good at it because it's my core competence, that's game changing for the industry. It sounds a bit uh, like a sales pitch, David, but it yeah. actually shows that uh, the software companies and the banks are on the same level playing field, right? That's right. In, in, what's interesting is banks have understood that they've got the core assets, they've got the customers. Customers, tell, you're not going to go to Apple for a mortgage. So people do have a relationship with their banks. Banks have trust overall. What they've done is they've taken eye their eye off the customer experience. 
And, and every other industry, if you look at retail today, it's totally transformed. You order on Amazon and it lands in your garden about two days later, the way it's going. Whereas the banking experience hasn't really evolved. So what banks are understanding is that they themselves need to leverage their core competence with fintech, some of these nimble providers you talked about earlier, well, and bring those providers in right. and make put a fintech wrapper, if you like, a good client experience around that core relationship with their customers. If we take a look at some numbers uh, for IT spending among the banks, uh, your customers, they spend about 55.7% on IT services, etc. Is mm. this enough? And uh, to which uh, level should they boost it? <laughs> It depends on where your view of the industry is at the is end game. Either you, either you see this as a burning platform or you don't. It's really that simple. An industry that has not evolved in 30 or 40 years that needs to become as agile as the new players needs to find, well, however they find that model, they need to find the investment capacity to invent themselves as a digital player, not just by putting fintechs around the outside of the bank, but changing fundamentally the, the view of the customer. So artificial intelligence, for example, sitting at the heart of the transaction engine. So if somebody goes on the internet, you can offer them real-time view of their position. You don't send them forms in the post to fill out and tell them three months later whether they can have a mortgage. So either you see this as a, 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 a re reinvention of yourself as a tech provider under the guise of a regulated bank, or you don't. If you do that, you will find the investment. 55% is a little bit like today. It's certainly better than the 80% that banks are spending maintaining their internal systems. But you need to be spending, you need to be spending a good 30 40% of your IT spend on being innovative and reinventing yourselves. That's and quite more a lot. Are getting it. Let's uh, shift gear a little bit, David, and talk about Brexit, one of oh, our okay. news stories uh, yeah. of our times, obviously. How mm. is this impacting Temenos? It doesn't really, it doesn't really impact us uh, directly. We're a global company. We have less than 4% of our revenues from the UK. Um, so in terms of our UK customers, they have, they have their own business agenda to execute. But, but I'd like to put that in the context of the overall challenge that banks face today. There are many things that come and go. There's political, political issues, as you can tell at the moment, between, between the US and China, for example. There's macroeconomic issues. There's political issues such as the UK. Are you hurt by the US-China trade war, no, for example? not then? at all. No, that, what was... But you do have business in China. We have business in China. We have a lot of business in China, including with the international banks, and we have a lot of, lot of business in the US. But what we, what we basically do is we go into a bank and we deal with a structural issue that unless they fix it, they have an existential threat to whether they exist as a bank. In that context, all these noise, political, back, political backdrop, um, economic challenges, maybe a bad quarter or two, um, is, is really background noise. This is the number one priority of a bank today. Imagine you're the CEO of a bank wondering what to do in 10 or 20 years. This work, Brexit is just an example of one of 20 or 30 things that are going to come at you that, that you still have to operate in a, in, a, in a period of uncertainty. So what we're seeing is the decisions to buy our software because it's so key to their strategy cuts through all the noise of all the politics and economic backdrop that's going on at the moment. A lot of banks uh, in London, though, have announced uh, plans to move their staff mm. elsewhere, to Frankfurt, Paris, etc., even moving their headquarters. Your headquarters is in Geneva. It is, yes. Is this a decision because of tax incentives and Geneva becoming more attractive for tax reasons? Not at all, actually. The company was founded in Geneva. The founder, George Kukis, a fantastic individual who's still on the board, actually, bought a Swiss-based company. It was a subsidiary of a Swiss company called Cos AG. There was a hardware provider back in the day, 25 years ago. And this hardware provider had ended up owning a software asset, which was a non-core business. When they decided to divest of that software asset, they sold the company in Geneva. And ever since then, Geneva's been the headquarters of the company. Switzerland stands for a lot of things that we hold sacred. Um, prestige, bank, it's the home of banking, gravitas. It's not a sort of slick, slick US-led, if you like, um, relationship we have with our banks. It's built on trust. It's built on long-term relationships. A lot of the values that are held sacred in Switzerland. So the majority of the management team are physically based in Switzerland. The, the companies run out of here and we're very, very proud to be part of the Swiss community. In fact, we've created a lot of employment in Switzerland since the beginning. If we talk about people in your company, one major shareholder is Martin Ebner. The uh, famous uh, Swiss That's financier, correct. he still holds about 15% uh, in shares, uh, a 15% stake in uh, Temenos. How important is his role today, David? Martin is, um, is an institutional investor. Martin, uh, it's not for me to speak on his behalf, but Temenos is a $12 billion market cap company, 100% free float. The management own a large percentage. For most of us, the large percentage of our own personal net worth is tied up in the company because of our belief in the future. Martin is um, an individual who has the luxury of being able to truly operate long term. 
because it's his own money, effectively, he, he's able to see, see through cycles. And if he feels he's spotted a structural story, and he's spotted a few over time, he, he, he doesn't need to look too much about the short-term noise of quarters in and out. He believes an industry is ready for conversion and he's able to place bets behind that. So he's been a very loyal shareholder. He's an institutional shareholder like all the rest, um, like, um, like Capital International and the majority of the large institutional investors that have also taken a structural view that the industry is changing. And Temenos is likely to be the winner in that end market. And so, I must say he has done a pretty good job been betting on uh, Temenos, right? He has, yeah. So who are your other shareholders and how are you planning to diversify them from here? Around 40% of our investors are US, so it's 100% institutional investors, so large tier one names like BlackRock, Capital International that you would expect. We're, we see about 30% of our free float in Switzerland. We have home market advantage here. We know a lot of the investor base, and I think there's, there's a little bit of pride in Temenos in the Swiss community. The rest is spread around Europe, um, and the rest is in the US. But more and more, we're seeing the investor base of Temenos moving towards long-term structural growth-driven funds who have the ability to invest for three or four years uh, on the basis that Temenos is likely to be a category killer. With the rise of cyber attacks and uh, fears of cyber theft and data security and all that, how bulletproof is your banking software? That's a very good question. Well, we have 3,000 banks using our software in some capacity every day, and none of them, none of them have ever had downtime, so it must work. Uh, we're a software company, so obviously we understand we're right at the cutting edge in terms of penetration testing and all of the, the rigor you'd expect to see around a software company that sells the same product to every single customer. Um, that's our core value proposition. In fact, many of our banks come to us because they themselves, their core competence is not this. And in the world of open banking, it was fine when people would physically have to break into your branch to access your system. In the world of open banking, where people can come in through a third party gateway, like an Apple Pay or something, very, very difficult for banks to stay on top of the, uh, the open challenges and the, and, and the challenges that they have. So often they come to us because they say, you're really good at this. Your core competence is building software that's locked down, impenetrable, and we want to focus on our core business, which is running a bank, competing against the new players. Have you received any threats, any attacks uh, so far? Like any software company, there's constantly people trying to get in, but nobody's ever succeeded. We, we have a very, very robust system, and um, we, we're very proud of uh, the fact that not one of our customers has ever had any downtime through any software leakage from us. So far, so good. Now, earlier this year, the uh, British uh, Financial Trading Systems Forum, Fidesa, ditched your takeover bid of mm. 1.5 billion British pounds. Uh, you must have That's been correct. very disappointed by that. <laughs> You, you have to look at all these assets. It's, a, it's our, our job as custodians of the, of the shareholders' money to make sure that we, we execute on the opportunity. Now, our base business is going extremely well. You can see the market. For, banks need to change their systems. The, 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 we're beyond the point of no return now. In that context, where, where banking is going, going through a massive once-in-a-generation change, much like the manufacturers did in the 80s, 90s, which led to giants like SAP and Oracle being created, if you feel the underlying dynamics happening, it's beholden to us to look beyond the organic case of recruiting more people, penetrating more accounts, and seeing what more we can do with the shareholders' money. We look at a lot of companies, including Fidesa. We have, however, very, very tough criteria. Something's got to be a very, very good product. We're a product company at heart. That's what we do. We don't buy things for the sake of it. In Fidesa, we found a very good product. And why did they decide not uh, to let you take them over? We, somebody decided to offer more, simple as that. So we understand we can be very quick in deciding which is a good product, and we found that. However, we have very good financial hurdles to make sure that things are not diluted to shareholders' money, because plan B for Temenos is always to reinvest in Temenos, to buy back Temenos shares. So for something to be more exciting than Temenos and more strategic, it's got to be very, very exciting. So, so we look at a lot of assets. a higher offer. Yeah, so we, tell we, me, David, where are your next acquisition plans okay. then? Well, I suppose the good thing about Fidesa is that with the fact that others, others came in and paid more means we did spot a good asset. Sadly, others spotted as well. Listen, we'll, we always look at companies. We have an active pipeline at any point in time. Which countries are you looking at uh, in specific? Globally, around the world. Um, we have three types of acquisitions. We look at customer bases, so buying older software companies where we can effectively buy their customer base, install our software in their customers and use it as more of a sort of a Trojan or launching pad to accelerate a geography. Sometimes we buy technology if something is moving very fast, like mobile technology or analytics, for example. We might buy something which is really disruptive and we don't have the time to bring a team together and, and build the product. Uh, and then the third one would be moving into an adjacent segment like treasury capital markets. So we have a, part, we have a whole team of people who's dedicated who are dedicated to going and looking at um, looking at those targets. Nothing, obviously, I can say on the record at the moment. They could, we, we look at many, but we do have very tough criteria. We've only executed 
11 acquisitions in our whole history as a public company. So Every one of which has been extremely right, accretive. Let's so, talk about the Swiss market here as well. Avalok, for example, uh, mm. is a smaller player than you, um, but it also offers the same kind of banking software products. Uh, yes. It has a smaller market uh, cap. Are you planning to maybe also do business with them, uh, team up in the pipeline? No, obviously I couldn't comment on something like that. Listen, the whole point with 20% of banks buying packages and 80% doing absolutely nothing, we're, we're in a really unique position that there's plenty for everybody. 80% of banks have to move from building their own spaghetti to buying packages. In that context, the, the, the market opportunity for Temenos, Avalog, all the other big software companies is absolutely immense. We're quite unusual. If you look at any other software industry, to grow, you've got to take market share from a competitor. You've got to be disruptive. You've got to move to cloud. You've got to do something a bit quirky. 80% of our customers need to do nothing. If we win even our fair share today as, as leader position of that 80% as they convert, Temenos, Temenos' value proposition is fantastic. So Your focus at the moment is very much in terms of of geographies on the US, uh, Canada and uh, Latin America as well. What about Asia? Asia's always been a, a good growth market for us. I really would say three geographies. Europe is the powerhouse for us. It's where we started in Switzerland. In Europe, IT costs are high. The cost of maintaining spaghetti with European salaries is obviously higher than in other geographies. So the first wave of growth we saw was European banks wanted to take out their spaghetti and put in a package to save money. We then started to see emerging markets like Asia Pacific, Latin America, certain parts of Middle East and Africa needing an agility. We started to see that emerging middle classes were coming through, unbanked, needed broader banking relationships, and banks needed to go live as quickly as possible. Not so much about saving back office costs, because labor historically has been cheaper there. So we then saw a, far, a period of growth, which today comprises 40% of our total revenues from emerging markets, predicated on get, get, come in, get me live as quickly as possible so I can gain market share and have first mover advantage. Let's We've then seen that back bring in Europe. things home, David. Mm -hmm. uh, you are headquartered in Geneva, as we mentioned. A bit unusual because Geneva is known for being international Geneva, the spirit of Geneva, a lot of mm. international organizations, NGOs and embassies, permanent missions obviously based there. Mm. How do you feel about Geneva as a future hub for technologies and innovation? I think Geneva and Switzerland, in, in fact, overall, is, is, got a, is very foresightful in terms of understanding the, the power of technology going forward. More business models have become intellectually property driven. If you look around the world, the creation of leaders like Amazon, the whole retail model has gone totally to IP-led IP -led businesses. Switzerland is ahead of the curve, I think, in understanding, not just through their fiscal structure, but also the way they empower organizations uh, through, through, through incentives and, and, and grants uh, and focus on, in, on, on education systems through the universities to, um, to foster the next generation of companies. So I don't think, whilst Tebanos today is in the Swiss Leaders Index, we've just been put into the top 30 companies of Switzerland at $12 billion market cap, I don't think they'll be, it'll be long before others follow. This is a real hotbed for innovation, not just Geneva, but Zurich as well and, and Zug, obviously. So as an insider, where do you see the next uh, unicorn in Switzerland? Ah, that's very difficult to say. Not, not, not one for me to comment on. I Maybe think, from Zuga, uh, because you're very much uh, embedded maybe. there in the uh, cryptocurrency world. Maybe, maybe. What we do is good old-fashioned application software. This isn't a technology play that comes and goes. This has taken us 25 years to get to the point where 3,000 banks around the world trust us every day to run mission-critical systems. There's no shortcuts to that. You can't put five brilliant kids in a room and create a Temenos. This is blood, sweat and tears, hard work, getting banks live in something mission critical. The barriers to entry in our space are very, very high. So we, we are number one player today. We're number one in the world, obviously not just Switzerland. We're, we're winning the majority of the big deals in the world. So when people like JP Morgan, Santander, Bank of Ireland, Societe Generale are looking for a core system for a major part of their business, they're going to come to us, not because we've got a good product today, but we have 25 years of pedigree. And that won't be easy to replicate. You are from the UK originally, David, mm. uh, studied there, a uh, Bachelor of Science, then studied in uh, Freiburg in uh, Germany as well. Correct, yes. How did you get into this software business? Ah, OK, that's a very interesting question. So I was uh, having finished in Luxembourg selling a, a technology company called Tele2, it was a, in the telecommunication space, actually. We had a very good um, understanding of intellectual property. So we founded, a, on the back of dereg deregulation, a telecoms company called Tele2, which I think is still going, and sold the business. And I was looking around for innovative ideas, and George Cook, as the founder of Temenos, had brought together, brought in a fantastic, a fantastic CEO at the time, Andreas Andriadis, who's still the chairman of the board, who had taken this good idea that George had found it and wrapped a business model around it and laid the foundations for what was going to be Temenos' success. And I was so intrigued by the management team that he'd put in place and by the potential of taking the last industry in the world to write 
sort of that buys its own software and a well thought out packaged business model and bringing those two things together, you could just tell that if this was executed correctly, somebody was going to be able to create a giant in it. Exactly. And as you studied software and science and mm. really understand the business as well from a practical perspective, do you actually think it's good to have this kind of insight? Or do you think in terms of a CEO and manager role, it's better sometimes not to know the trick of the trade? I'm very clearly of the opinion you absolutely need to know what's going on. If you think you can hide in your head office in Geneva and sit there and count your, count your dollars, something is fundamentally wrong. Temenos' culture is built by every single member of the company being extremely close to customers. If you look at the world's best software companies, they've typically been run by a technologist, if you take a Steve Jobs or a Bill Gates. Um, we've man the, the, as somebody who understands the product at the heart of what they're doing. And Andreas has formed that role within Temenos with the founders. So you need to start by being extreme. You need to understand where your product's going. You need to live and die passionately by that product and you need to be present with your customers. So whilst Andreas and the team focus very, very much on understanding where the market is going and where the product should be going, I and the rest of the management team spent our time, 100% of our time, with customers understanding how that software is being used, are they happy with it, what they would like it to be, to be seen differently. And it's that strong, strong culture that differentiates Temenos from our peers, I think. But it's more that your role is basically engaging uh, with clients and customers, Correct. but you wouldn't really categorize yourself as a tech freak or a mm, nerd. Absolutely is it? not. No, Very, I'm, I'm really the eyes and ears of the, of the, of the product mode in the, custom, in, the customer, in the customer's eyes. Thank you so much for coming in and all the best for you in the future, David. Thank you very much indeed.